Right, presentation is live. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, our session today on understanding pediatric complex trauma, the science, medicine, and long-term outcomes. A, a pithy title, if ever I heard one. Uh, before we kick off, uh, we're going to quickly show a slide which will give you options around audio translation and captions. And I think this is all also uh, a link to in, in the chat as well. So if you need any of those, please do take advantage of them. Uh, if I could also point people towards the, uh, the session chat um, where people could leave questions and, and comments about, about this topic, about what we're gonna go on and talk about. Uh, and I will uh, hopefully pick those up and, uh, and ask, ask them to Emily as we, as we crack on. Um, thank you again to all the organizers uh, for today. I'm sure it's a, a huge effort, both the hybrid nature of it all, as well as corralling so many people, but of course, huge ambitions around uh, this conference, around sort of setting out this vision of, of humanitarianism in the future. And it's really exciting to, to be hosting one of these sessions. And it's even more exciting to be hosting one with a very uh, familiar face, uh, that of Dr. Emily Mayhew from Imperial College, uh, who I I have to, uh, full disclosure, have known for several years now. So if our chat sort of borders into sort of areas uh, that are a bit more random, then that's totally our fault. Um, but uh, Emily is here to to talk about this issue. Um, and I think before we do, though, I think there's sort of two, two aspects, if you will, to today's conversation. Uh, one is around partnership, allies, what it means to be a humanitarian, what it's like to work uh, across a sort of spectre of operational uh, programming to to research and to uh, academia and how those things can all link together, which I think is a core sort of lesson and part of the story of the, the Paediatric Blast Injury Partnership and the subsequent Centre for Paediatric Blast Injury Studies. But obviously the second element is much more focused on the issue itself in an era of uh, multiple conflicts of almost 300 million people in humanitarian need of what we're seeing on a daily basis come out of places like Ukraine, Gaza, uh, Yemen and beyond. Uh, the issue, I think, is, is more pertinent, sadly and tragically than ever. Uh, and uh, there's lots and lots going on around it, which is exciting, and lots and lots that could go around it in the future, which is perhaps where people who are listening in uh, can, can contribute to. So this is not a, a closed partnership, I always say. But Emily, if I could turn to you, perhaps um, as a way of introduction, if you could perhaps give us uh, a bit of a background as to yourself and, and what it means to be a, a medical historian, which may not be a, a profession that many have come across in the past. Thank you, James. Good morning. Uh, as, as, as you say, I've said that a lot um, uh, over the last five years. Uh, so I am uh, not just a medical historian, I am a military medical historian. And that means that I focus primarily on wounding. Um, I always say to my students, if you show me the wound, I can tell you about the war. So I'm interested, if we look at it more in medical terms, in complex trauma um, that is inflicted quickly and unexpectedly. And I'm interested in the point of wounding, but I'm also interested, very much interested, and I've grown more interested in the long-term outcomes of someone who survives uh, a, comp a, a wound and what the rest of their life, the rest of their life beyond survival is going to look like. And I have an odd uh, position in that I am the historian in residence in the Blast Injury Studies Department at Imperial College, uh, because the Blast Injury Studies Department also does what I do. It's, it focuses on the wound and specifically it focuses on the outcome of explosive weapons, because in the 21st century, that's been probably the source of the most complex form of wounding that we've found ourselves responding to, firstly in a military setting and then more broadly across the world. And I began my uh, life, uh, my professional life, sitting in the Centre for Blast Injury Studies and trying to understand what that, what the centre needed to be looking at beyond the point of wounding. So we had a cohort of about 800 uh, soldier, UK soldiers um, and Afghan soldiers from the Iraq and most particularly the Afghanistan war 
and they had wounds that we had never seen that they had survived and it wasn't enough simply to say okay you survived we'll change your dressing and give you some crutches and move on we needed to understand the science of the wound and how we could offer a better outcome starting with scientific research so in 2009 we began researching adult blast injury what it did at the point of wounding, what it did in the medium term, and now we can research what it's doing in the long term. And we've become the most significant research center to, um, for understanding adult blast injury. And the findings that we made now inform treatment at the point of wounding through re rehabilitation and on into people's lives uh, as, the, as they are currently lived. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I, what I'd really do is I sit in the Centre for Blast Injury Studies and I remind them that they need to take a very long view. Mm -hmm. And how, in, in terms of the very long view, as a historian, how far back do you look? Do you find yourself sort of uh, comparing aspects of modern conflict to the Napoleonic era? Or how, how do you sort of choose which area of history to, to sort of focus on? I, I'm, I'm quite disciplined with myself and I really I talk about modern warfare and modern warfare for me is really warfare that is engaged on a very large scale that is primarily about explosive weapons and whether that is a landmine, uh, a rocket propelled grenade um, or large scale artillery, which means that I don't have to go back much further than the First World War. Although we do have issues from the American Civil War where you start to see explosive weapons pro mass produced being used on a battlefield, what you don't have is the ability to save people's lives. In the First World War, you have uh, this, this coming together of industrially produced explosive weaponry in multiple forms and the ability to save people's lives. If people die, we, 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 we don't learn. We, we learn from people who unexpectedly survive. So I have a good cutoff point. I don't really do much before 1914. But what is really um, frightening for, or, or, or chastening for me is that I know the outcomes of, of almost everyone in the UK who survived blast injury and I know what the rest of their life looked like and it looks very like the survivors of blast injury from the 21st century wars you know you can I could I would say I could pick up my medics and my patients and put them in a time machine which we don't have and I work at Imperial College so I would know if we did um, and I took them back it would all look and feel very much the same. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting isn't it the sort of um, the links between sort of the more purely military space and how that has has kind of fed into uh, what is now the modern humanitarian space, thinking particularly about the Battle of Solferino and the emergence of the Geneva Conventions and the ICRC, and I guess the, the originally seen as the sort of an issue around reaching wounded soldiers. Uh, you mentioned um, the Centre for Blast Injury Studies uh, and the cohorts that you dealt with. Whenever I think of of CBIS, um, not, not being obviously as close to it as you, I always kind of think of the issue of uh, improvised explosive devices wreaking havoc on on Western troops in, in Afghanistan and in Iraq, and then this sort of investment uh, of interest to say, how can we better protect these soldiers from, uh, in terms of their clothing, their vehicles, their sort of way of operating, and then of course, uh, that point of injury that you described and being able to to get to them with sort of you know emergency responses in the back of helicopters and to uh, this concept i think that i've heard you mention before the sort of unlikely survivors I, I wonder whether you could tell us a bit more about about what that sort of journey from the beginning of those conflicts and seeing the ieds proliferate and take such a heavy toll and, and what kind of steps uh, were taken by militaries and how and how they were uh, informed by the work of, of cbis well, it was really a, a different mindset. Um, we had not seen uh, IEDs or legacy munitions. There was a lot. Excuse me. There was a lot of. I mean, there was a lot of legacy munitions left over every time somebody invades Afghanistan. They leave behind their footprint in terms of twenty-year-old shells that have been buried, uh, landmines that have been buried. I think Afghanistan, in particular, was a place where we really understood that explosive weapons were going to be the problem, the primary problem for our casualties, um, and we. We had, again, a, an odd mixture, much like the First World War, where we had, uh, they were industrially produced, they were they were artisanally produced, many of these, these IEDs, but they were produced in very large numbers, and they were used specifically against the forces that were, were in, in Afghanistan. But we also had the ability to save people's lives. We understood uh, acute uh, resuscitation, we could get people 
from their point of wounding to a hospital, whether it was a, a British Army hospital or a US Army hospital, usually within 20 minutes. And people may know this, this term, the golden hour. We also came to understand that if you could deliver enough care within the golden hour, then those people who should have died do not. And then for a, as a historian, that's when it gets really complicated because it isn't, I think we spend, that's gone into our collective consciousness that, you know, it's, it's, it's that thing we see on television, you know, the, the people, you know, with the electric paddles, boom, clear, someone doesn't die. The helicopter lands and takes casualties away and they don't die. And it's very dramatic. And people think, well, that's the difficult part. But it's really not the difficult part. The difficult part comes once you've survived and once you go back to your home, whether it's a, a city in Afghanistan or whether it's coming back to the United States or coming back to the UK or whichever country you were from. And then you face the reality of what blast injury means. And it usually means limb loss, um, one or, or possibly more. And it also, the, the, we now know, and this, is, this was particularly came out of our scientific work, that the blast wave itself, um, the invisible blast wave passing through human tissue, distorts that tissue at the genetic level and means that you don't heal in the same way that you would have if it was a more straightforward weapon of war, if it was a, a, a much less uh, uh, brutal shrapnel fragment or a bullet or a bullet wound. Mm -hmm. And these, and this is the same, this is where the, the cohorts, whether it's a civilian cohort or a military cohort, this is where their needs merge. If they survive, and then they move on from the surgical unit that's treated them. What lies ahead is a lifetime of difficulty and hopefully a lifetime of support with rehab and treatment, but a lifetime of difficulty. Mm -hmm. And going back to that point, um, looking at sort of history compared to, say, Afghanistan and Iraq. So we're seeing in a historical context, people survive injuries that they never would have survived in history so the ability to survive these these weapons is unprecedented certainly in the military space yes. but that then leads to lots and lots of questions that haven't been answered about the long term that the lives that are led afterwards absolutely if people unexpectedly survive they then unexpectedly have a life beyond survival and we, we gen generally people don't plan for that it is they, they stick with the dramatic stuff they think well we've your life has been saved surely that's enough well it's not if you no longer have legs and you need to walk or work or go to school or all of those things and that is really unexpected that's really unexpected um and and again it's we have that that model from the military that people survived and then we needed to look again at rehab and at pain management and at how their lives are now how their lives are going to be as they move into becoming 40 or 50 or 60 years old and and we have that military model and we take that we should be taking that model out into the space where there are far far more casualties and understand that that's what we need to apply to them which is a nice bridge of course into sort of the next part of this story but perhaps before we go to that i'll just uh, give a shout out if you uh, are uh, a fan of reading i do recommend <coughs> emily's book a uh, heavy reckoning that goes into far more detail around the, the themes we've just talked about, available in all good bookshops and online. Um, I mean, one of the things I was really struck by reading that book, I think you sort of mentioned it there about sort of things we're learning about what happens, not just for the sort of more obvious injuries of, of, of traumatic limb loss, but also the more in, the invisible components of what happens when a blast may, wave moves through a human body and what kind of um, legacy effects that, that will have. But I was particularly struck actually in your book, you mentioned this point of, uh, of human beings that survive the loss of of one or multiple limbs, kind of their bodies expending so much energy to survive that trauma that it will sort of almost put them on a course for a sort of a faster paced life through to the end in terms of um, you know their vulnerability to chronic conditions and other things. And that that struck me as again something that is not going to be there's not going to be a Hollywood movie made about that, but it's going to be a, of course a, a huge part of the rest of these individual lives. And I'm and I'm just going to say, as you as you as you mentioned, a Hollywood movie. I really loved Oppenheimer, but the really big story of the Second World War is the fact that there are microbiologists on the east coast of America inventing antibiotics. There's never going to be a movie about that, but it's much more important for all of us. And that's exactly right. So the invisible blast wave, and if if people want to kind of simulate it at home, if you turn your hairdryer on and off very quickly, and you feel that that wave on your face, if you're a casualty. 
you may remember feeling that um, and what happens is it triggers responses all over the body for, for the more medically inclined. It's an inflammatory response. It's the thing that makes your nose run and makes, uh, if you have a cut, uh, brings the red swelling around the cut to close it off. And if you scale that up to the whole body experiencing this blast effect, um, inflammatory mechanisms, excuse me, inflammatory mechanisms are triggered. And current, what we now understand is they don't go back to normal. And so they, they turn the body, I, I often think of that, the reference from the film Spinal Tap, where the volume is turned up to 11. And that is what appears to happen with adults who experience blast injury, complex blast injury. It's like everything is turned up to 11 and we can't get it back down to, let's say, five or six is normal. Mm -hmm. And what we see now, we've been able to, these uh, the, the, co the cohort has, has now been medically discharged and they've remained part of our scientific research, um, is that they are aging twice as fast as someone who hasn't experienced a blast injury. It doesn't necessarily mean that, it, that this is drama as dramatic as it sounds, but we need to make sure that in uh, alliance with their medical professionals and their caregivers, that they keep an eye on their blood pressure, on their weight, on their all their cardiovascular mechanisms, because we can see that those have all been affected. So now we, we know that, we, we suspected that that might, might be the case, but 10 years after we started the center we now know that is the case we know what it looks like um, um we, we we see that it is is continues to be the case and we're in 10 or 15 years after injury and that's a really important point to note the blast wave has an effect at the systemic genetic systemic level on adults so how else is it affecting the people that it brings down and that's a pretty i mean it's a pretty stunning thing to try and kind of get your head around the notion of people surviving these horrendous injuries, aging twice as fast. Um, on the sort of, so we've talked a lot about the military cohort and, and militaries investing hundreds of millions of dollars looking to better protect their soldiers and treat their soldiers who've been injured. Uh, I, obviously, I work for Save the Children, so why are we talking so much about the military? How did this, um, this sort of uh, issue find its way into the civilian space and more specifically the paediatric space? Well, it happened. I can I can tell you the the, the year and and the date. Um, I was speaking much as I've just spoken to you now at the Science Museum uh, on for an event that marked the centenary of the Battle of the Somme, and they asked me to talk about exactly what I've talked to you about the the wounded from the Somme, about those who who had experienced blast injury and what their outcomes were after they came home as survivors of the Battle of the Somme. And I remember meeting a colleague of yours who came up to me and said, um, OK, how does this work for children? And I said the thing that everybody says if they work in adult blast injury, which is it's about the same, but 50 percent less. And that is not the right answer. But I did at least follow it up with, can you just wait till tomorrow and I'll go and ask our pediatric trauma people and see what they say? And he did wait. And I went to ask our paediatric trauma colleagues who work uh, at St Mary's and a number of the other Imperial College hospitals. And I, and I said to them, how how's blast injury likely to affect children? And they and they sighed and they said it's not 50 percent less. They said and they said the thing that we all set, try and say before a meeting. They said children are not little adults, Emily. They're little human beings. And the answer is it affects them in very particular ways and we haven't looked into it, but they are a separate cohort and we need to ask the same questions of the survivors of that cohort that we asked of adults, because we're going to find that there are very different answers, but which need equally need our attention. So you're going from this kind of situation where you have a limited number of sort of Western soldiers in close proximity to explosive weapons, to the issue of children, who we know over one in six children globally are in areas affected by conflict. So far higher numbers, hundreds of millions of children in close proximity to explosive weapons. Uh, and what did the sort of, what did, you, you tested this thesis as you described that children are not uh, little adults. In fact, uh, adults are, are big children, I'll always look at it. Um, <laughs> and, and then what did this sort of, what, what happened next? How did this sort of, concept that had been tested by academics, uh, proposed by or mentioned by humanitarians, what happened next to that? 
So we had a, we we realised that, that that this was exactly the case that we were going to be talking about a very specialist, uh, a very particular but very large cohort. But we had the advantage of thinking of them as a cohort. I don't, I think before we started to do this work, people had not, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> thought about children <coughs> as a blast injury cohort. They thought about children who were injured. They didn't think of them with this very specific injury. So we did. We saw them as a blast cohort. So that was one advantage that we brought to our thinking. And the second advantage uh, that we brought was we realised we didn't have the answers, but we did have the questions. When it comes to paediatric, the paediatric blast injury cohort, they are known unknowns. So the, the, the first thing we realised we realized was we needed to, to really audit what we'd done with the adults and see how it might apply to children. And that was a, a, a straightforward scientific thing to do. We looked at all our different research um, projects. We realised that the, the vehicular protection, which had been a real pri priority for the, for the military, was li less likely to be an issue for the child cohort. But the effect of blast on tissue, issues with prosthetics, all of those subjects could be applied very readily to the paediatric cohort. And we began to realise that we we didn't have the capacity to access the paediatric cohort. We didn't we knew where to start, but we didn't know how to take it into that world. Mm -hmm. um, but we had met Save the Children by then. And so the next step for us in realising that there was something that we could do but we couldn't do it alone was to set up a partnership with Save the Children. And, and that was what we did. I think three months after after we met, we I came to Farringdon Road and, and we sat down and I said, we are a university that does science. You're a humanitarian uh, agency that that reaches directly into the heart of the cohort we want to get to. How can we make this? How can this be a partnership? How can we make this work? Because it was very new for both of us. And interestingly, again, I, I always think this partnership is made up of such an interesting um, kind of constellation of actors, because as you speak, there's the researchers, the academics, the sort of imperial side of things. There's the, the Save the Children's, the Humanity Inclusions, the uh, the various other uh, uh, NGOs that work in, in spaces linked to this. And of course, I remember being asked at the time, so is Save the Children going to get back into surgery? And, and the idea really wasn't that that say the children would do things or be the one that sort of operationalize things, but rather our role as a, a convener. And I guess also within this kind of um, this constellation, there was lots of uh, um, military medics who I think uh, had a very sort of personal passion to this issue. Um, I wondered if you could speak to potentially Dr. Paul Reevely, who was one of the sort of uh, the, the key players in this um, and his experience in Afghanistan and what that led to, to him to want to do. Absolutely. And although it, it seems like it's very binary, you have the military cohort and the paediatric cohort. Actually, for most of the, the military medics who work in who worked in Iraq and Afghanistan <clears throat> in the conflicts there, I, I think they would tell you that over half their patients that they treated were children, were children, the, the child patients, um, children who had stepped on the same IEDs, who'd, 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 um, who'd, sub, who'd been wounded by explosive weapons and for which they had no preparation. If they were lucky enough, Dr. Paul Reevely is, is our is our paediatric is of a paediatric lead for the partnership if they were lucky enough they were a paediatrician but they would be working with a team who had never dealt with children and there are technical issues but the difference between a, a little human being uh, who's a child and a much bigger human being who's an adult but through Paul and this was I think this was the moment where we understood that this partnership was 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 probably going to work that we were going to have to we were going to have to you know remember where we were and, and work, work at it from both sides but Paul told us something that was not technical it was not about a blood supply it was not about surgery he said when the first time that you receive a child brought into your operating theater you might have three or four years of experience of dealing with uh, explosive casualty in adults but it may be the first time that you've seen a child or there may be something about that little body that lies on the stretcher before you that's too short that reminds you of your own children and he talked about how that can cause you to go out of the emotional window that you can lose focus that the whole team can lose focus and somebody needs to say Come on, everyone, back in the room. We have a patient who needs us. It doesn't matter whether they're a, a, a big patient or a little patient. There's a patient that needs us. And I remember uh, Paul explaining that within the context of Save the Children. And, and 
whilst to, as scientists we had we'd struggled to recognize that humanitarians all nodded and said oh yeah we know that we know that that's really important and i think from there um as well as a number of other more technical demands from there came our our pediatric blast injury field manual because we wanted to create something that would be in the space that could be useful to humanitarians useful to medics that would be in the space that would enable people to come back through the emotional window and close it and get on with the job of saving the life of a child mm -hmm. yes i mean it's a real reminder uh, i think for us all about the potential value from getting the right people in the right room uh, and i think we can say that five years five years later on the basis of what what has happened um you mentioned the so we've got the the center pediatric blast injury studies very much obviously focused on on soldiers during uh, in, in the sort of shadow of, of Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, then we had the coming together of of this of this new partnership uh, with all the different actors you've described, including Dr. Paul Reevely. Uh, we were able to bring one of our uh, national partners based in Syria to that meeting, a partner called Syria Relief. Um, and you know, I think you've mentioned a, a bit about what they were looking for. They were sort of saying. You know, dealing with an, an intense conflict in urban areas affecting uh, civilian populations, uh, a health system that was under huge amount of stress. A lot of doctors who'd been killed, injured, had fled the country. Uh, a lot of a huge absence of specialists when it came to the pediatric uh, space. But of course, uh, you know, veteran trauma medics, because of course, the nature of how, how much they were dealing with. Uh, could you tell us about uh, you know, the sort of the, the round story of the pediatric blast injury? Manual? What were they looking for? what was uh, produced and, and perhaps then what happened to it afterwards? So handily for a historian, there are, there are these specific moments that I remember. I didn't keep any of the papers. That was really stupid of me because I didn't know it was going to, five years later, we'd still be talking about it, which was a bit stupid of me. But I guess I've got emails somewhere. Um, I, I mean, really, and a very bad example for me to set as a historian, always keep your paperwork. Please keep your paperwork. Put it somewhere in a box and put it in your attic and bring it down. But we had a workshop where we identified people, specialists from every part of the continuum. So we had people who worked at the point of wounding and who did specialist uh, rehab for children, who did specialist burns rehab. Um, and, and Save the Children brought us our, our colleague from Iraq. And we talked about what was needed. And I remember him saying there, sitting there and saying, what we really need is just a little book that we can use if we have experience in treating the wounded, but not but no experience in in adapting that that knowledge for children. We need a little book that tells us stage by stage of the casualty continuum what we should be doing. So again, not just that dramatic moment of when the life is saved, but what, what happens in ward care, what happens in pain management, what happens in early rehab? How do you take what you already know and adapt it for a little human being? So we all nodded and I wrote down, I do have a piece of paper where I wrote down just a little book. And then we said, well, what about an app? And he said, no, we don't want an app. We've got enough apps and we can't always charge our phones. Uh, we want something that is a physical object that we can pass around, perhaps that we can take pictures of the important pages. So they wanted something that was kind of old, was, you know, everything was apps then. I think we, we've taken a step back from that. But they wanted something that could be readily circulated um, in British and in Arabic um, and which enabled someone who had never treated a child to go through to the section on pain, on infection management, on, on sleeping, on management with caregivers, and find something that was specifically in there for children. And it, it, there was nothing new, there was, no, there was no original research, we just asked everybody uh, to come along who, who represented that portion of the field manual to put their knowledge in one place. This is the field manual is a very small manual and it, it represents about eight different textbooks. You'd have to have eight textbooks and that would be difficult in a situation like Syria where light is limited, where power is limited to have to go through one of eight textbooks to work out what you need. But the manual is designed specifically to do that. And what we really, uh, what we were very happy about, again, things that we didn't know, it had been designed 
we found a humanitarian systems designer. We thought, I think this is probably the best lesson that I can give everyone. Don't think you can do it yourself. Dr. Reevely and I thought we could do it on PowerPoint and print it out. No. Um, and then the universe sent an extraordinary um, graduate of the Royal College of Art Humanitarian Systems Department our way. And she was a graphic designer specializing in humanitarian systems. And she designed a manual for us. And she and did it. Did it she did it in iDesign, which turns out to be a really flexible graphic design software package and very readily translated. So I think as I as we as we speak today, the manual's been translated into I think is it eight languages? Seven with a couple more to come. So Dari English, Dari, Pashto, Arabic, French, um, Ukrainian, Ukrainian, Russian. And we've got uh, Chinese and Spanish. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, I think the Chinese one goes sprint next week. Um, so it's a it's, uh, simple language Chinese, so it works as broadly as possible. And as I say, that was we didn't know when we asked the designer to work for us that that was a question we should have asked. How readily can this be translated? But actually we can. And I would suggest that if you are putting together something that's going to be circulated and you have aspirations for it to be circulated world, worldwide, bear that in mind. Um, when you're thinking about creating literature, how readily can it be translated? How can you, can you find a translator that's not expensive? Can you use a software program which which enables um, quick, reasonably priced translations? In fact, we had the universe was with us. It enabled us to do that. Um, and I know that it exists. It still exists as a physical manual, um, but at the moment we're using uh, PDFs. And I know that uh, the, there are PDFs that have been sent to I think it's Egypt. Egypt, which have now been printed in Egypt and gone in to support medics who are dealing with pediatric blast in that particular region. And again, it was a it was a good flexible little little object. It was just a little book, just as yeah. we were asked for, and and it seems it, it's worked. And again, I'm always struck by um, the sort of contrast, if you will, between uh, the investment in protecting soldiers uh, that has resulted in you know very advanced kit and you know, uh, vehicles and, and and these surgeries in the back of Chinooks, et cetera, and, and where we are when it comes to the pediatric space, which is very much at base camp, but obviously establishing uh, all the all that one needs to be done following and in the next uh, years that go. And I'm just conscious also welcoming colleagues in the chat from, from various locations listening in from Cameroon, from Nigeria, and also I think from Uganda and some specific questions that I will I will bring to Emily about uh, about in issues in Uganda uh, in the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Uh, so we've got the field manual, we've got these various languages of translation, but we haven't really yet gone into talking about why, you know, we know that children are not uh, little adults, but uh, perhaps if we could go into some of the sort of specific vulnerabilities or specific um, characteristics that make uh, that children experience these, these uh, weapons and these injuries through, uh, for instance, again, from a layman's perspective, and I'll, I'll sort of shoot out some, some sort of starters and tell me where I'm A wrong, what I've missed. But uh, I guess the things I'm really struck by is that, as you say, children are, are growing. So they, their lifetime of injury is not simply the survival moment. It is then how they live the rest of their lives with that injury, whether that's uh, focusing on, on prosthetics that they will then have replaced and that will grow with them, whether that's the pain management they will require for how long, whether that's their ability to access society the economy school in ways that they would have wanted to but but just starting at the physical again children um have thinner skin they have less blood to lose their the burns they experience will then grow with their their body their sort of proportionality of their their sort of posture and their stature relative to a blast may see or does see higher rates of of head injury i'm wondering yeah if you could sort of and anything I've missed on those spaces or anything you'd like to elaborate on that makes I think it that, so that that does sound I don't think you I don't think you've missed much uh, and obviously when we think about the rates of survival of of the militaries in Iraq and Afghanistan that we're simply we're not able not to able assess to. or compare yeah. rates of survival with children so so uh, and I think we would we would disappear down a rabbit hole from which we would never emerge so we th we we're really thinking about both of those cohorts once they become an unexpected survivor and what distinguishes children from adults is that children are still growing it is the really obvious thing but it it, it it is the it is the thing that makes them the most 
complicated patient cohort to deal with anywhere in the world. A child trauma cohort is extraordinarily complex because of the nature of their bones. Um, we 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 often forget about i think any parent will will know about the the nature of children's bones they'll know about green stick, stick fractures children's bones are softer and they are doing what is extraordinary things they're growing um they're all growing in 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 more or less the same way if they're receiving the right nutrition um they have safe if they're not they have safety features which means that bone growth can be protected but they are growing and that's really where the difference is. So you can, you can, with child blast injury, you you can again put a, a relatively neat uh, 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 core, uh, frame around it. Once a child has stopped has stopped being adolescents, once they've reached puberty, then they become an adult, and then they move into the category of receiving adult blast injury care. But before that, they need something very specific. So they are. It's all the really obvious things about children. They are. Their bones are softer and therefore the protection that as an adult you might get from your ribs, from your skull, from your pelvis, children don't get that. So the things that are that we know are very destructive on adults and are almost always destructive to children are things like um, abdominal injuries and children are, are smaller, they're lower down if, if they're picking up. Uh, if they're or they're touching a, a landmine, a legacy munition, or recently uh, in in the conflict in Ukraine, we know some very small explosives that almost seemed, and I can't think that as a species we would do this, but they seem designed to appeal to children. They pick up something that looks like a toy. It's not a toy, but it's small, and so that the impact of the blast uh, hits their abdomen and their head. And in both cases, in adults, that would likely be deadly. And it almost always is with children. And their skin is finer. And this is something to think about in particular. Um, this is this is country specific. So if you're talking about a blast injury cohort in Uganda, in Nigeria, anywhere where you're talking about children who will be of color, this will be something that will affect a burns will affect their skin very differently and much more severely than it would in in northern Europe or, or, or um, uh, Caucasian where the population is Caucasian. So I think I talked early on about how uh, the blast wave passes through and disorders healing so that it means that people don't repair in the same way that they would if it was if you don't have this blast wave. That's particularly true for children of colour who receive a burn or a skin injury. Anyone dealing with those communities will know that that children of colour tend to suffer something called keloid scarring, hypertrophic scarring, where the, 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 a cut or, or soft tissue damage will heal, but the, there will be a, um, a response that's exaggerated. So larger amounts of scar tissue will be produced. So particularly, I know I know that, that Bob uh, from uh, Uganda, I think, has, has talked about children suffering stigma and discrimination um, and isolation. This is something that can be very specifically related to blast injury because children who suffer a burn on their face or their hands or their bodies those burns in in other uh, in other places in the world might repair um, uh, more effectively but with children of color with uh, they will have more scarring and that will, may lead to them uh, being isolated and discriminated against so there are some very specific links between the pediatric blast cohort and uh, stigmatization and discrimination and that's that's one thing to think about to look for a child who may be recovering from a burn and again i'm a historian please look uh, please think long term this may be a child that has worse scarring than you anticipate and that may affect how they're able to re-socialize yeah uh, i'm going to come to questions in a second so do do please put them into the into the chat we've got some uh Nice softball questions, including how to solve the issue of malnutrition affecting children caused by conflicts and climate change uh, that Emily can address, I'm sure, in a minute. Um, so we've got, again, just to sort of get the history of this, the, the CBIS work on the military cohort, the development of the Paediatric Glass Injury Partnership and its deployment of a first ever Paediatric Glass Injury Field Manual across multiple conflict settings across multiple languages. Uh, we then have the war in Ukraine and, again, you know, vastly more interest in in children who are uh, experiencing blast injury through, through rockets and, and landmines and beyond. Um, and that led to sort of a more, sort of the next chapter, if we will, of, of this partnership. Uh, could you tell us about the launch that happened last year of the Centre for Paediatric Blast Injury Studies 
uh, and what it's trying to do. And if you could also perhaps talk those who are in the room or on the call who have not uh, been lucky enough to visit the uh, the very uh, exciting labs in uh, White City, the Imperial uh, Labs, uh, sort of talk them through what they look like and, and what, what researchers are trying to do there. So uh, it was last March, we opened the first ever Centre for Paediatric Blast Injury Studies in the world. Um, and it's built on our, our Centre for, for Adults Blast Injury Studies. I, I'm trying to kind of get those people to always put whatever adult or child in. That isn't what hasn't worked yet. But we've been able to adapt a lot of what we know, actually, in terms of the big technologies. So we do some very, very uh, hardcore uh, blast uh, 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 blast physics and blast mechanics work with um, machines that that can generate a blast wave which can then be applied through various materials so when you come in what you see is some big uh, big machines uh, that go bang and uh, uh, somebody said they go bang and they go squish so we have a very large machine a set of machines that can simulate blast either by by a blast from under by really punching uh, various fabrics or using drop towers which also simulates blast and they're surrounded by cameras and x-rays and various uh, visual video recorders that mean that we can really look at this in a very scientific way we can look at it down to the very cellular level to the very most minute level and we can build our thesis on from there when you go to the second part of the lab I think what you'll see is our real focus our real focus is those children who have lost limbs particularly those children who've lost lower limbs because what we currently know everyone will tell you who's ever had anything to do with child amputees who have leg prosthetics is that child leg prosthetics don't work very well um, they they cause problems with the gait the child will grow out of them very quickly and I, I think this comes back to some really good points made by Bob I'm sorry I know I'm getting my head of myself in the questions what we are absolutely focused on is creating a prosthetics and support systems that enable children to have a better prosthetic leg and then go back to school. Um, I think that's that's kind of our that's kind of our icon. I mean, there are lots of other things participating socially, participating in sports, but if we can create a prosthetic that better enables children to go back to school, that answers so many questions for what remains of their their, their childhoods. Uh, if they can't go to school, then we look at the discrimination, we look at the isolation, and, and then we see the real problem start. So we see the second part of our lab that contains what we call a gate lab, which is where we can analyze how people walk. We have all the pre 3D printers you can possibly think of where we can build prototypes for our new legs. But we would like to create, this is our this is our what we're really looking at. We would like to create a prosthetic that will be widely available. Uh, producible locally that minimizes pain and enables access that's that's what the second part of our lab is for is is to create something that currently doesn't exist and it in its really it's a it's a really diminishing piece of equipment uh, and 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 we'd like it gone I can't tell you when, because as one of my scientists said, science is slow and humanitarians want everything so quickly. But yep. we're trying, we're trying. I mean, it's a, it's a really important and interesting point, actually, because um, I guess, again, um, five years ago when this partnership was set up, uh, we did not have the war as it is in Ukraine. We did not have the situation that we have in Gaza. And this is leading lots of people to say, why don't we have X, Y and Z now? Yeah. which is of course as you say the different timelines and things and of course just to to give you one another statistic that may may stay with you and this was from january so the numbers will be very different now but uh according to uh, unicef uh statistics and, and what the, our country office in uh, palestine uh did more than 10 children per day on average uh were losing one or both of their legs in gaza uh since the conflict began and that conflict is now uh, four months in. So uh, again, that's just one conflict, albeit an incredibly intense one, that is seeing the creation of a whole new cohort, uh, as you describe it, of of children who will uh, have to deal with limb loss for the rest of their lives. And I was really struck, one thing, again, sort of in the more, uh, the less cerebral space, I was really struck um, spending time with some of the researchers at Imperial uh, about the issue of um, prosthetic rejection from children, about mm -hmm. children who 
uh, did not want to wear prosthetics if they were lucky enough to be able to get them. Uh, often, and this issue of younger children not wanting prosthetics that did not look like their their real leg, whereas older children perhaps uh, were happy to sacrifice um, the sort of visual look of the prosthetic for a more functional prosthetic that could allow them to do more. I think that's a really interesting concept. And the, and the researchers at Imperial are spending a lot of time talking to children, which is, again, you can't emphasize how important that is to mm. ensure that what they are working on is something that children uh, will actually use, which, which would seem incredibly important. Absolutely. And and certainly the children that, that reject their legs because of the skin tone, it's not enough just to fix the skin tone. What they, they already see their leg as being something that doesn't help them, that in fact makes their life more difficult. It doesn't really fit. It causes them pain. We we see uh, in, in cohorts, not in, in war zones, but in, in particular in, in Asia, where children have hip and back problems, age seven. This is not a world that we should be living in. That's the thing for us older people, but children shouldn't have that. So a child will reject a because it's not helping them but also because it, 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 it their pain their inability to walk and the fact that it's a different color from their skin tone draws attention to their disability and they would rather that people didn't do that um, yeah. one of the things the, the talking to children is important if you came to our second lab um, you'd see a quite a, a rickety looking staircase so it, it, goes up four stairs and then it comes down four stairs and it, everything else looks very flashy and very scientific and here's this wooden you know a P, a, um, mdf uh, staircase and that came from saying to children what is that what is it that you do in your prosthetic that's difficult and again no one had asked them before and they all said stairs stairs are a nightmare so when our researchers came back, they asked they asked the Imperial College Carpenters to build us a set of stairs and we can incorporate that into our gate lab. And when we're testing our prosthetic models, we can use the stairs. We can ask a child who comes to try that to, to both walk up, to walk in our gate lab and to walk up and down the stairs and we can see if it's working. That's what happens when you ask children. I think we learned that from you actually, because Save the Children does talk to the children that it's saving. And I think we learned that from you. Take children seriously. They are little human beings, not just Yes. Or well, the other way, I always look at it, our, our one shared experience as adults is that we were all once children. We but were, again, going back to this, this pathway of injury, so you have a child, uh, you know, this very, very large number of children who are threatened by blast injury. You have those that uh, suffer blast injury uh, and those that are lucky enough to survive it, uh, going back to all the points mm. we've raised. You then have those who are lucky enough to receive prosthetics. Um, mm. Of course, going back to your point earlier about children growing, can you tell us a little bit more about you don't just get one prosthetic and off you go and you don't just have one operation and off you go and you don't just have one bit of pain management and off you go tell us a bit more about those three things absolutely so could children one of the things that we're going to be look, that we are looking at in our center is that nobody has ever looked at the effect of blast on growth growth mechanisms absolutely fascinating most fascinating mechanism in the human body how how bone says today we should grow and again those of you with children or who, who maybe remember experiencing growth pains experiencing those spurts of growth particularly in adult adolescence in adolescence that's a bio, that's the biochemistry of your brain brains um, of your bones working not your brain and uh, the, if a leg has been lost, but there is, uh, if, if a child has, has kept one leg, that leg will keep growing, which means that th that the, the leg that's been replaced by a prosthetic will not match the other leg that's still growing uh, within about three months. So a new prosthetic will be required. The bone stump where the bone has been lost uh, uh, to amputation will also grow. It will grow more slowly. It won't grow. At least we think it will. We don't abs we don't actually know. We hope to know soon because we have a research centre now that's specifically looking at those sort of things. Um, and what will almost certainly need to happen, and, and we know that this is happening over the last year if from the, uh, the paediatric cohort from Turkey and Syria. Uh, so there is a, a cohort being monitored by a university of 100 children. It's a lot more children were injured, but they have now had the initial amputation that removed their badly damaged limb. And that was required to save their life, to produce a stump uh, that could be managed from the point of view of the infection. And that meant that they could try out a prosthetic. But that in the last year, that stump has kept on growing. And so they have had to return for two, possibly three, what we call take backs. Uh, with adults, that happens every five or 10 years. But with children, it can happen. It can be required, not on a month by month basis, but certainly once a year. 
So for every photograph of a child that you see where their, their legs have been amputated and there's perhaps a neat little white bandage, that child will firstly assume the presence of pain. But that child will need more surgery until they stop growing. Does the system that's in place provide that child with the likelihood of being able to get that surgery? Because otherwise it doesn't matter how good their prosthetic is, it's not going to work. This is the this is the, the outcome. This is life beyond survival for a child that has lost limbs, particularly lower limbs. Yeah. It's going to need a lot of attention going forward. And we, we we're, we're trying to raise awareness of that, that it isn't just enough to do something now. It needs to last for the next 10 or 15 years. Yeah. And of course, um, we touched on it, but children are not just not like adults, but often they're not like other children if you compare a newborn to a uh, an adolescent and of course I, I guess the particular challenge of pre-verbal children when it comes to things like pain management and, and what they need from a prosthetic and also the, an interesting point if you could touch on it some of the researchers uh, discovering that essentially children are having to learn how to walk again with prosthetics um, one question that uh, Matthew Roberts has put in the chat which I guess I, I suspect it might go into the bucket alongside the skin tone one around areas that we need to learn far more about which is also I guess and not just you know different children of different ages in different contexts affected differently by blast but also um uh, you know, would would the same blast affect a healthy child as it would a mal a child with mal suffering from malnutrition is uh, is the question he's asking and i wonder what we know about that at this stage so we're working across college luckily imperial college is very large and it has very good global health um departments a, a selection of global health departments and we've recently met a, a phd student who's specifically working on how nutritional school meals can can work to resolve malnutrition within school populations it's really important that we understand that malnutrition in is in play for blast injury uh, recovery because as Matthew probably knows and I'm sure that everybody who's listening knows is that a malnourished child is a child that will experience wasting and stunting. I talked a little bit about the safety features that bones have if they're not receiving enough nutrition to grow normally then they will stop growing until proper nutrition is received so this is an added layer of complication in terms of growth if you have a population that is malnourished and it is also a population that has a cohort within it of blast injured children you can't use the normal metrics for children to see how long their legs should be and how their prosthetic should fit we know there is a phenomenon called catch up so that when children are able to receive proper nourishment, either from the provision of school meals or supplements provided by humanitarian organization, that children can cut, catch up on their growth. That's a difficult thing to assume when you're designing a prosthetic for them. So we need to have a catch up proof prosthetic. We can't resolve malnutrition in the Center for Pediatric Blast Injury Studies, but we need to pay attention to it. it. It is in play when we think about our cohort, when we think about our global cohort, that they're not always, they don't always have the same skin or soft tissue reaction to blast injury, and they may not always have sufficient nutrition to recover normally. So I think that's the, the only thing that I can say to Matthew is that we can't resolve malnutrition on our own, but we do pay it close attention and it's part of our research. It's part of our research question. So hopefully it's part of our solution. Great. And I, and I guess, again, it comes down to the sort of intersectionality of many of these issues, the complexity of them and the importance, again, of those of us in different humanitarian tribes or those who don't even uh, necessarily think of ourselves as humanitarians but, uh, but, but potentially are and I think I would put Emily certainly in that bracket uh, of of connecting uh, to work on this and I would also um, in the things we haven't discussed that we could talk about for a lot longer for example are are things like antimicrobial resistance and what that looks like in a world in which children who've suffered uh, limb loss require uh, antibiotics within hours to to save their lives and lots of other issues that we've not uh, gone into uh, I'd also point uh, listeners and those in the room to uh, you've already, I'm sure, got the Heavy Reckoning book bought at the beginning of the session. There's also a very cheery title um, called uh, The Four Horsemen, uh, Hope, it does have hope in it as well, okay. and The Hope of a New Age, which touches on uh, war, pestilence, famine, and of course, death uh, by Emily as well, which I would strongly recommend, has lots of uh, um, aspects that we touched on today as well. So uh, I think with 
last two minutes to go, I would like to thank again uh, all the organisers at uh, the Humanitarian Exchange for putting this session together, giving it a profile it needs to encourage anyone who is interested in this issue or who has expertise or uh, something to contribute towards it. It's not a set partnership, it's a very open one, so please get in touch. Uh, and through, through Emily, through Save the Children or anyone else, and I hope the subject hasn't uh, been too heavy ahead of lunch, and I hope all of you have uh, a good rest of your conference. So thank you and good day. Thank you. Thank you.